Whether you have a skin interest, a skin query, a skin trauma, or skin disease, I warmly welcome you to Heal Thy Skin, a podcast brought to you by Derm Health Co. I'm Marnie, dermal clinician, dermoscopist, and your podcast host. Skin is deeper than beauty, and our mission is to build the largest platform of specialized practitioners focused on skin health and skin empowerment. Join me each week where we go deep into the skin and beyond to hear stories and education from leading practitioners on a journey of skin health. Hello, welcome to the Heal Thy Skin podcast. I'm Marnie, your host, and today I'm speaking with Gary Sherwood of the National Alopecia Areata Foundation. Gary has been NAF's communication director since 2012, and the National Alopecia Areata Foundation was founded in 1981, and it provides support to patients afflicted with alopecia areata. What is alopecia areata, you ask? Well, the term alopecia means hair loss, and alopecia areata is a type of hair loss due to an autoimmune disorder that often results in unpredictable hair loss. Sometimes the hair loss is permanent, other times it might just be in small patches and it may grow grow back. However, um, much of the public is not familiar with alopecia areata and it can have a profound impact on one's life and functional status, both at work, school and private life. Gary is going to share more about the condition and also the amazing work that NAF is doing over in the US and we're going to be talking about all the different activities and camaraderie that just makes NAF such a wonderful foundation. I started by asking Gary what he thought was the biggest misconception about alopecia areata. The biggest misconception of alopecia areata, I think, is that some people oftentimes rather innocently conflate alopecia as just one big disease, like it's all the same thing. You say, I have alopecia, another person says they have that too, and they think it's the same condition, where it might actually be very different. Alopecia in and of itself just means hair loss. If, let's say, I develop male pattern hair loss, that's a form of alopecia. Let's say if you were to tie your hair like in braids, and you start having hair get pulled out and you lose hair because of that, that's a form of alopecia too. It's called traction alopecia. Alopecia areata, however, is hair loss caused by autoimmune means. It's your immune system, for whatever reason, we don't know why, is not recognizing the hair follicles. It attacks them and it causes the hair to fall out. It's just like when the body might attack an organ after an organ transplant. That's a really good differentiation, especially because I think I would agree that people would just assume that generalized term of alopecia could mean specific things as well. So tell us more about it. You mentioned that the cause is an autoimmune condition, but what is maybe that some of these leading causes of that? Is it hereditary? Do we see it in certain age groups? Like give us a little bit more of an overview about alopecia areata specifically. It's tricky, to be real honest with you. It's very vexing. Yes, there are indications that it could be hereditary, especially if you have a parent with an autoimmune condition, you are more likely to develop alopecia areata yourself. You have a lifetime risk of 2.1% of developing it. So in terms of numbers, that would roughly equate to about 6.9 million just here in the United States, or around 143 million around the world. So if you were to take Australia's population, for example, Multiply that by 2.1%. That gives you a pretty good idea of how many are affected just in Australia by this condition. Now, you were asking about, you know, are people more likely to get it, say, if they have a relative? So, yes, if uh, you have a parent who is affected by an autoimmune condition, yeah, you are more likely to develop it. We are seeing that it more often than not will strike younger people, especially children. That's not to say that adults cannot get it as well. Sometimes adults are diagnosed with it. It can happen, but it's more likely it's going to happen in childhood. Interestingly enough, there was a recent study that also suggests that women of color are now more likely to develop alopecia areata. Is that something new? Yeah, and do we know why that is? We don't. It's, again, it's a very vexing condition. We wish we knew what were the exact triggers. It would make finding treatment to cure obviously that much easier, but we don't know right now. That's something that investigators are definitely looking into. 
and trying to find what is causing that. What is what I've heard you refer to as the secret button, you know, that causes it. We just don't know. Yeah. Because a number of people who have this condition, you're probably aware, they'll then have regrowth. And we don't know what causes that either. And then you may have that regrowth. And then for whatever reason, that immune system of yours, again, no longer recognizes the hair follicles. And again, the hair starts to fall out. So what are the different types of alopecia areata and how is it diagnosed of this type specifically? I'm glad you asked that. So there's what's called patchy alopecia, and that's the most common type. That would be where you'll lose patches on your head about the size of, say, like a dime or a nickel will come out of your head. And what you'll want to do is you'll want to make an appointment with your dermatologist have them look at it. And what the dermatologist is going to look for is white spots where the hair was. They're also going to ask you, if possible, to bring in hairs that fell out. You can collect them from your pillow or wherever, because they'll want to see if it's the entire hair. They'll want to see if the bulb is attached. If it is, that's a very good indicator. It's alopecia areata. If let's say you brought in hair, but it didn't have the bulb attached, it was like more torn out, that would indicate it's hair loss by traction. You know, that might be like a braid's too tight or a hat's the wrong size. You know, you might just be rubbing your head as a nervous habit. But if it's the whole hair, that means it's being forced out by your body. It's the immune system that's causing it to fall out. How interesting. And you mentioned that there's often a white patch where that hair loss has been. So is that permanent? I do not believe that's permanent. I think if you do have regrowth, that white patch is going to disappear. Now, you ask the different types of alopecia, so that's one. Then there's what's called alopecia totalis. That is all the hair on your head falling out. And then the most severe form is alopecia universalis. That is all the hair on your body. That is everything. And you know, I would encourage your listeners to really think about what that would mean if all the hair on your body fell out, not just the hair on your head, but you're losing the hair in your nose. You're losing your eyebrows, your eyelashes. And those are filtration systems. You know, that's how they develop. You know, that's why we have them. <laughs> that's why nose hair exists, because it's to filter out, you know, impurities in the air. And keep it does have a purpose. <laughs> it, they, believe it or not, there is a reason we have all this stuff in our bodies. And, you know, if you lose any of it, you start to miss it in a hurry. And so, unfortunately, people who have these most severe forms of alopecia areata, then they are more prone to getting colds, getting eye infections, you know, to all sorts of things, which normally if you do have these hairs, these eyebrows, eyelashes, nose hair filtration systems, you're not as prone, you know, to get these. Mm, which is this vicious cycle, right? Because these people are most likely already have some kind of immune disorder and then to have absolutely no hair and be more susceptible to colds and flus and things. So that, that's a very good point you're making. And I'll tell you something too, being that this is 2020 when we're recording this, a big question from our community members is you can understand is, are they more susceptible to COVID-19? I am very happy to say so far, there's no evidence at all of that. Not that we don't continue to follow up every scrap of research on this subject, but so far, you know, in what's it been now, eight months of this pandemic, there's been no proven evidence of that whatsoever, but we still follow it nonetheless. You know, we just don't want to say, nope, you're perfectly fine and then forget about it entirely. You know, we do follow as much as we can, but so far, no evidence at all that you're susceptible. You know, you got to keep in mind that when your immune system is attacking the hair follicles, that's not a sign that it's grown lax, just the opposite. That's actually a sign that your immune system is being overvigilant. It's being almost too careful. It's not letting things stay, which should stay. You know, it's just hyper aware of things doesn't feel should be there, even if they're really harmless, like your hair follicles. Mm, yeah, really interesting. Now, you mentioned that uh, you will need to take hair in to see the dermatologist or they might inspect the scalp. What are they actually looking for? Well, as I described, they are looking for those little white dots where your hair was, and they are looking to see the condition of the hair itself, because that's a very good indicator to them that it's hair loss by autoimmune, that it's alopecia areata, that it's not hair loss caused by something else like braids or a hat that's worn the wrong way or something else. If they can see what those hairs look like, that tells them pretty quickly what it is. And the white spots are usually a good indicator of that as well. 
is there, and I'm not sure if the statistics around this or it might just be feedback from your community, but has there been cases where by someone didn't know that they had an immune condition and then they had alopecia areata and then that immune condition was then diagnosed as opposed to the other way around? Like what's generally the progression? Yeah, I would have to imagine there have been cases like that. And unfortunately, I don't have statistics to offer you on that. From my interaction with this community over the last eight years, what I've usually seen, it's the hair loss first, then the diagnosis and finding out that they have an immune disorder. So you mentioned that there will be patches. Sometimes it grows back, sometimes it doesn't. How quickly does the hair fall out? Is it just over a period of days or can it be months or years that it can progress? That's a very good question too. And most people who I've spoken to when they tell their experience, they say it happens very fast, like within weeks. That would be quite shocking to all of a sudden just be losing clumps of hair. Well, and then add to the fact that it's more likely to happen if you're a child or a young adult, when you're already going through all kinds of other changes and you know, you're trying to fit in with peer groups. And we all know from our own experiences, kids are not always the most understanding or nice people when they see someone with a difference. So you have to go through that and that can just be absolutely bruising. You know, obviously, you know, we're doing all we can to, you know, help prevent bullying. One of the things we have in our arsenal is a school packet that we send out to parents and schools who request it. And it's just something that, you know, it's just one more thing that young people in our community have to be ready to deal with. And Mm -hmm. luckily, a few years ago, we started our youth mentor program. And that is, you know, just as described, it's something where we have young people who have alopecia areata they've had for a number of years. They're in their late teens and 20s. They are then matched up with children and people in their early teens who also have alopecia areata, and they're given advice and they're told, well, here's what I went through and here's what helped me and here's what can help you as well. That can just be life changing not to feel isolated. And that's part of, you know, what we do at Derm Health Co as well is that realization of when someone is diagnosed with a skin condition, often they feel like they're the only person on the planet that has it. So just hearing and sharing those stories of others, especially those that are in similar age brackets as well, uh, I can imagine is really powerful for those that come through. I'm interested to know, have you had an influx of people that have been diagnosed with alopecia areata since COVID due to increased stress uh, and, you know, that psychological just trauma that many people have experienced? That's something that has come up. And we don't know with certainty how much of a role stress plays. There's some evidence that it plays a significant role. There's some evidence that it plays really next to nothing because little kids can get alopecia areata and little kids are generally not under a whole lot of stress. Now, there have been you know, some folks in our community who have claimed that since COVID-19 hit, especially in the early stages of it, we were just learning about it and you know, people were getting pretty scared and this was all new. I guess now in October, we're a bit more used to it, but in the early days of it, yeah, people we're saying, I think that I'm developing, you know, greater hair loss, you know, because of the stress of having COVID. So I'm not going to discount that at all. I I would not be surprised at all if there were people who were diagnosed, you know, during the initial stages of the pandemic. But as to whether or not stress is the key factor, I think the jury is still out on that. Some say yes, some say not so much. Mm. You mentioned earlier and before we started recording that the organization or the foundation is accredited or governed. Uh, So is alopecia areata seen as a medical condition in the US? Because I know in certain countries, certain conditions aren't even recognized as a medical condition. So I guess my question is, how did this come about? But also going back to all these studies that are needing to happen, is that happening because it is now recognized as well? Is there more funding going on and and things like that that you're seeing? Alopecia areata is recognized as a medical condition here in the United States. They then have an organization called the National Institute of Arthritis and Musculoskeletal and Skin Diseases, NIAMS for short. NIAMS is who maintains the research portfolio for alopecia areata. So all government dollars that go into research on alopecia areata gets passed through the NIH into NIAMS. And so one of my roles here at NAP, in addition to being the communications director, is I also oversee our patient advocacy. Eight years ago, shortly after I started with NAP, I founded our legislative liaisons program. 
and legislative liaisons are people either with alopecia areata themselves or they have an immediate family member with that condition. And they go and they meet with the offices of their congressional representatives and senators, both at home and in Washington, DC, to help get laws passed to help the alopecia areata community. And one of our evergreen asks is always for more money for alopecia areata research. And I'm proud to say that we've seen that funding go up tremendously since the program has started. So even those legislators that were not aware of alopecia areata, say eight years ago, they're very well aware of it now. President Obama, in fact, mentioned alopecia areata in his budget address to the country. I believe that was in January of 2016. Wow. We've made quite a bit of headway. We had a meeting with our Food and Drug Administration in 2017. It was their biggest meeting to date. We filled a room to capacity. Had anyone else showed up, they would have had to have people wait in the hallway. Incredible. And the people with alopecia areata and their family members speaking about what their conditions have been, what's actually like to have this disease, what were the pain points. That's what the FDA wanted to know, like what's the most painful thing about having this disease. And then they also wanted to know what would you like to see in a treatment? Because the FDA is going to be who approves that treatment here in the U.S. We currently do not have an FDA approved treatment in the United States. We do have treatments which are available and I can talk about nothing approved by the FDA. So the FDA wanted to know exactly what the community wanted in the treatment. And just a a story I always love to tell is about how we had people of all ages there. We had this one little girl who was, I believe she was five years old at the time. Her name is Rosie. She's from the city of Chicago. She was there with her mother. And when they had mic runners go up and down, you know, through the audience, her little hand shot up. And they brought the microphone over to her and she said she didn't want it to be an injection and she wanted to taste like chocolate sauce. Oh, bless. (laughs) I think she spoke for the whole community there. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Anything tasting like chocolate that was medicine. How amazing. So what were some of those main pain points that came out from the community? Oh, boy. Well, just that feeling that you're the only one who has this condition, feeling ostracized feeling different. If you're a young person, a child with a condition, being bullied, you know, being made to feel like you don't belong, like there's something wrong with you, like when other children won't play with you because they feel that they could catch what you have. And let's just add for the record right now, alopecia areata is not contagious. If you were to, you know, be in the same room with someone who has it, if you were to share a cup or a plate of food with them, you're not going to get alopecia areata, you know. It's not transmissible that way. But, you know, if someone doesn't know that and they just think, oh, that kid is sick, there's something wrong with that kid, I don't want to get it, then, you know, we see that happen. And so that was probably the biggest pain point is that uh, I would say the other pain point is just having your life change by losing your hair so quickly. It's not that you can't continue to do what you were doing in your life. If you were in school, you can still go to school. If you have a job, you can still hold that job. Anything that you were doing before you had alopecia areata, you can still do. But obviously, psychologically, emotionally, you may be on a completely different plane at that point because you may be feeling ostracized. You be, you're made to feel different. You look in the mirror and you don't recognize that person looking back at you. I do not have alopecia areata myself, but I've shaved my head a couple of times just to remind myself you know, what it looks like, why we do what we do. And it's interesting to see the, the person who looks back at me. On one hand, I recognize them. It's like, yeah, that's my face. But, but I do look quite a bit different. And it's just interesting to see like what a transition there is when you don't have hair. Yeah, it completely changes your whole look and appearance. And especially for those that they do lose their hair so quickly, it's not like you can get used to that progressive hair loss. It's happening so suddenly that one week you had hair and The next week, you might not have hair. And I should add, too, that when I shaved my head, I always kind of like had the luxury of knowing that, well, it's going to grow back. Obviously, if you lose it through alopecia areata, you don't have that luxury unless you're one of those folks who it goes into remission and then the hair grows back. But that doesn't happen to everyone. Yeah. And that wondering, will it grow back for me or will it won't? Yeah. So talk to us about the foundings of NAF in the US because you've been around for quite some time. And just judging by that story that you mentioned about people flooding into the hallways, there's a lot of support, which is really incredible to hear. But talk to us about the humble beginnings. And I'd love to hear about how you got involved as well. Of 
course. Well, NAF was started in 1981 by three women here in the Bay Area. We're in Northern California. And these three women, as I recall, the story of how they encountered each other was one of them appeared on a talk show in San Francisco. And the other two women saw her on that talk show and got in touch with her. And these three all had alopecia areata. But in 1981, no one was really openly talking about it. You know, it was one of those things you kind of just kept it to yourself and it was your secret. And you were fortunate if you knew anyone else who had it. In most cases, you didn't. You thought you were the only one. So here in 1981, these three women get together. And I believe the first step they took was to start a support group. That's, that support group was started in San Francisco. It's our longest running support group. It still meets. And so they started that and the organization grew from there. They soon put a board together, a board of directors. And it, we were always headquartered in San Rafael, California, still are to this day. We've just been moving to bigger and bigger offices over the years. The first patient conference, as I recall, would have been held in November of 1986 in Las Vegas. I think they had a few dozen people attend that. The conference has grown with every year until our last in-person conference was in Seattle, Washington in June of 2019. And I believe we had roughly 600 people at that conference. We usually get between 600, 700 people. It depends upon you know how many the hotel can host, but that's usually the number we bring in. It's alopecia, areata patients and family members and loved ones. We have a kid's camp designed for children with alopecia areata and their siblings. The kids are put into age groups and there's all kinds of activities for them. Meanwhile, the parents, the adults, they can attend all kinds of workshops. You know, there's a workshop that I oversee on advocacy and holding fundraisers. Uh, we have other workshops on if you're a parent, how best to work with your kid who might just have been diagnosed. We have Ask the Experts panels where we have like top investigators into Alpi Shariada there to answer your specific questions. So there's a lot that goes on. We have guest speakers. We have a big dance, which um, I've been DJing for the last several years. It's a lot of fun. And it's, you talk about life-changing. If you're someone who you've had this condition and you think you're the only one who has it, and then suddenly, bam, you're in a hotel with like several hundred other people who also have it, and you see them going up and down the elevators and you see them in the restaurants. I mean, we're basically, we basically taken over the hotel, you know, that totally changes your outlook. That totally changes your perspective. You can't help but go back home feeling 10 feet high now, you know, because you know, you're not alone. You're far from it. Yeah. How amazing just to have that collaboration. I'm sure people meet lifelong friends at these type conventions as well. They do, especially, you know, what's really heartening is when I've been with the organization eight years, when you see someone who came in as like a child and now you're getting to like know them as a young adult and you've seen that progression. And I mentioned that I oversee our legislative liaison program. And I remember we have this one girl who is so great. She's a legislative liaison in Southern California. But when I met her, she was in what we call junior high school here in the States. You know, she was, I think, 13, 14 at the time very shy, just clung to her mother. And now she is so loud and proud and doesn't wear a wig anymore. In fact, she does some fashion modeling. And so just to see that growth over the years, it, you know, it does a lot for us too on the NAF staff. You know, the conference is life-changing obviously for the attendees, but also for us as well, those of us who work at NAF, you know, to see what we're able to do for these folks. You know, if you can just change one person's life, that's something you get hooked on. And you want to do it more and more and more and more. And you asked me how I got involved with the organization. I had been doing advocacy work for a major insurance company here in the States for 13 years. And one of my responsibilities was overseeing in-kind donations. I don't know if, if you have that terminology in Australia. In-kind means it's a non-monetary donation. So if the insurance company, say, had like cars from their fleet, which they were retiring and they wanted to donate, or if we had equipment from our offices, you know, computers, office furniture, whatever, I would then go and find nonprofits in California and find ways that we can donate that equipment to these nonprofits. And whenever I would meet with all these different nonprofits, I was always just so blown away by what they were accomplishing and how they were able to help people. And I was very jealous. I was very jealous. 
And so after a while, I said, you know what, that's what I want to do. I want to be able to use these skills because I loved advocacy. I loved meeting with our legislators, but I wanted to do it for something bigger than insurance or that would help more people in insurance. And so I remember finding that ad for uh, NAF needed a communications director. I believe it or not, I did sort of know what alopecia was through the TV show Arrested Development. I don't know if that's ever played in Australia. It was a sitcom that was on about 15 years ago with Jason Bateman. And there was a character on that show who had alopecia. So I kind of knew what it was, but I still went online, researched it as best I could. And obviously I was hired, but I remember saying my interview, as well as communications, what I really want to oversee too is advocacy for your patients. And I was very fortunate that the patient conference that year happened to have been in Washington, D.C. And we, again, had like 700 people there, incredible optics, you know, as we would say in the public affairs world. But I felt that as good as it was having that many people there, without people having relationships with their legislators already, there was only so much we could accomplish. And I really wanted to make sure that we had those relationships already in place with legislators. So that's why I started the Legislative Liaison Program, taking what I learned in 13 years of advocacy with insurance, bring it to the alopecia area of the world as well. So yeah, that's been kind of my experience. Yeah, what, what a wonderful journey. And I think for like nonprofit organizations and foundations and things like that, it often, I hear stories and will often start with either carers, moms, or those that might have a, a condition and they get together and, and then it starts to grow and develop. But not necessarily it has that business mind or someone from a corporate setting that knows how to get funding and knows how to speak to government. So it's really nice to just hear that progressive journey, but also where you can have something that is completely life-changing and, and really helps people at all stages of their condition, but also to bring in that kind of corporate knowledge and that business knowledge to further enhance what you can do for the community and further enhance the grants and the research and things that are going into it. because. That's so important. And without that, you can often be really burnt out or the foundation isn't able to grow and research isn't able to be done either. Yeah, I would agree with that. And it's, you know, so for me, it's been such a, a rewarding journey just for myself just to what to get to know these people, to make like really, you know, profound friendships with a lot of people in our community. And I'm not exaggerating when I say I, I, I'm friends with literally hundreds of people in this community from across the country. And they're just incredible to see what they're able to accomplish and to just even play just the tiniest role in that, you know, cause they're the ones who are doing it. You know, I can kind of point them in the general direction, but then they're the ones who go out and actually do it and get the point across. To just play just the tiniest role in that, just really, you know, it just, it, it really fills me with, with some pride and some real, some real satisfaction and just knowing that that's there's a lot we can do you know sometimes i think people take their power for granted but not our community our community is very powerful and we like to show them how they can use that power and by doing that we've really seen some incredible journeys you know happen you know right now as i mentioned earlier we're preparing for our end of the year communication that goes out to the community and one of the things I have the privilege of doing is picking out people within our community to write these emails. And we send out one a week where they tell what their story has been. And there's so many to choose from. You know, it's always, it's always fun to think of people, but at the same time, it's like, oh, but that means I can't ask this person this year. And they have a great story too. Okay, next year, I'm definitely going to ask that person as well. You know, there's so many tremendous stories of empowerment. And just watching that process you know, seeing how it's come about over the years, you know, seeing what, what we've really been able to do and just seeing the potential that's in this community. It's, it's something I could obviously ramble on about all night, but it's been really, it gives me so much more personal satisfaction than insurance ever could have done. I can imagine. Yeah, I can just hear the passion in your voice as well. You mentioned earlier about the youth mentoring program. How did this come about and what does that actually look like? Oh, wow. Youth mentor program. This is awesome. So this was actually the brainchild of a couple of people within our community, two young people, I believe they were still like high school or just beginning college when they came up with this. This was an idea that was, you know, passed up through the ranks, came, went to our board. Our board thought it was a wonderful idea. And so we started the youth mentor program in the fall of 2017. It is for people, I think initially we started, you had to be 17 years to uh, 30 to be a mentor. I think we now have lowered the age to 16 years. And the way it works is 
if you want to be a mentor, uh, you apply with us and just, just contact us and or go to our website and you can find how to apply for it. And then you go through an application process, you're interviewed first, you then have a background check done. That's very important. So far, we haven't had anyone who hasn't passed the background check, but still, you know, we always want to do it just to be safe. After the background check, you then take a training module, which takes about, I think it's an hour and a half to two hours to do the training module. After that, assuming you pass that, we then ask you to write a biography and submit us a photo. We put that on our website so people can see it. And then from the other side of it, if you are what we call a mentee, someone who's looking for a mentor, and it's usually the parents who uh, participate in this part of the process, the parent and the child, they'll scroll through that list of mentors on our website. And when they see someone they like, they reach out to us. The link is on our website. They reach out to us. And we in turn see if that mentor they've chosen is still available. And if they are, we put them together, a match is made. And a preconception I want to clear up too is sometimes people think that, oh, well, I have to live in the same city as my mentor. And that's not true at all. In fact, most of our mentor relationships are where the mentor and the mentees live in different cities and they communicate the way we are. They do it online. You know, that's the great thing about the age we're living in right now is that you can do this. And if you are one of those lucky few where your mentor lives in the same town as you, that's fantastic. There are a couple of relationships like that and they meet, you know, sometimes like they'll go and they'll get ice cream or they go to the park or whatever. And that's fine too. But most of them are online. And so what I love about this program is, as I said, it was started by community members. It's run by community members. Our administrator in charge of it is a community member. She's not a staff person. And it's run for the benefit of the community. So the community basically runs the whole thing on their own. We help, uh, but it's really their baby. And it's been wonderful to see that program take off the way it has over these past three years. Yeah, what a great initiative. And is it like a formal type meeting, like these are the topics that are going to be covered, or is it really just between mentor and mentee? It is between mentor and mentee. It's whatever they want to discuss. It's really driven by the mentee, I would venture to say, because they're the one who really needs that advice. They're the ones who need that help. So they know what they're looking for. They know the help they need. We do check back with the mentors and mentees to see how those partnerships are working out, if they're each getting out of it, but they want to. And if one party feels that they're not, then that's okay. Nothing wrong with that. And we can always match a mentee with someone else and no one's feelings should be hurt. Yeah, what a fantastic program. Now, I'd really like to jump back just a little bit and cover treatments. And you mentioned that there really aren't any FDA approved treatments for alopecia areata. What are some of the most common? There's a corticosteroid injections, and those are, they can be effective on some people. All these treatments can be effective on some people. None of them are effective on everyone, but they're injections. And especially if you're a child, you don't want to get injections. They're, they're not fun. Um, I've heard some people tell me they can be very painful. Some people have said not so much, but if you're a child, no, they can be painful and kids really don't like them. And I really encourage parents, you know, if your kid doesn't want to do it, don't do it. Don't force them to get an injection. If I can just side note here, one of the best pieces of advice I've ever heard is one of our founders, Vera Price, said the patient is driving the bus. So if you're a parent of a child with alopecia areata, they're driving the bus, not you listen to what they want and what they don't. So your derm might say, oh yeah, we'll just you know inject them with corticosteroid. If your child says, I do not want shots, that should be the end of it. Don't force them to get the shots. Yeah, that's really there, good advice. There is a topical minoxidil and that is more of a cream. It's applied usually once or twice a day. It's a 5% minoxidil solution. And again, it's been known to work on some patients not all. So just consider that, you know, just don't think that it's the end-all be-all. Uh, there's an, also an anthralin cream, which once again, works for some people. Usually you'll start seeing the regrowth in about eight to 12 weeks. Sometimes though, for some people, it can cause some skin irritation. So just know that going in. And as I've said about all these treatments, it doesn't work for everyone. There are topical corticosteroids, there's been improved regrowth in about 25% of patients who use that. So can be good for kids, especially if they don't want to do the injections, but the effectiveness can be limited, especially by how much of it gets absorbed into the scalp. 
So you just have to kind of know that if you're going to use any of these treatments, none of these are the end-all be-all cure. Now, we are remaining confident that the FDA will approve perhaps as many as two treatments by the year 2022. Let's remember that because of COVID-19, there may be a delay in that, but we hope not. We're still confident right now we're going to see those treatments in 2022, and those should be approved by the FDA. And when they're approved by the FDA, that means that they should work on most anyone who has alopecia area. There should be very few exceptions, and they should be safe, and they should be affordable. That's something we have to consider as well, and that's why I encourage people to get into patient advocacy, because if you have something that's put on the market, but it's going to cost you conceivably thousands of dollars for a dosage, well, that's no real help. You know, you want it to be where you can afford those treatments, where you can just go straight into your drugstore and just be able to purchase it with like just ready cash on hand, and if need be, your insurance will help you out with it, and boom, you can start taking it. We don't want it to be where you have to like mortgage the house or sell your car. You know, to get these treatments. So we're confident 2022, hopefully we'll see something by then. That's really exciting. And do you know what they will be? Do you have any idea what those treatments will be? In all likelihood, you're going to have a class of drugs called JAK inhibitors. And what these essentially do is they tell your immune system to stand down. So think of it as like if your immune system has an on-off switch, this is throwing the off switch. And once you throw the off switch, well, now there's nothing attacking the hair follicles and they can grow back. Obviously, the drawback would be if your immune system is told to stand down, it may not be as hyper vigilant as you wanted to in catching other conditions. So we have to take that into account as well. Yeah, such a personalized approach depending on the individual's needs. So I'd really like to just talk about the foundation and raising awareness in this advocacy. We have a global audience with the podcast. There is Alopecia Ariata Foundation or organization in Australia as well. But I'd just really love to hear some of your advice about raising awareness, something that you've done so successfully with NAF. And can, like, is it limited to just people in the US for NAF? Or do you also speak to people globally? How can those listeners that are in the US get involved? Just give us a bit of an overview. Well, as you mentioned, yeah, we are an American organization, but we communicate with people all over the world. We have support groups in such disparate places as Russia and India. We used to have a group in the Philippines. Unfortunately, we don't now, but we hope to have another one you know, in the near future. Uh, we have groups in Canada. You know, essentially any country that doesn't already have its own alopecia areata uh, foundation organization, you know, we can help, you know, set up a support group within. You know, it's our pleasure. And, you know, we'll, if you wish to email us at info at naf.org from anywhere, not only in the United States, but anywhere around the world, we're more than happy to answer any questions you may have. Now, as for spreading awareness, there's really no limit for how you can do that. Whatever you like to do, you can parlay that into spreading awareness. I'll give you an example of another program that we have here. It's called Team Up. And this program was started actually shortly before I came to NAF. I believe the first year they did this was in 2011. And I've been overseeing it since is where we team up with sports franchises across the country. And we would have games like where, let's say there's a game with, I'll use like, you know, here in the United States, the Golden State Warriors, big championship basketball team. Well, we would, you know, bring people from all over Northern California who wish to attend this game. We would attend the game. We would get like our own section, the bleachers to set in. We would try to get scoreboard announcements. We would try to get on court ceremonies. You know, we would uh, try to get like, we can have maybe someone with alopecia areata sing the national anthem, you know, anything like that. You know, and we, we started out doing these actually with baseball, but then we expanded it to pretty much any kind of sporting event. So we've done basketball, we've done hockey. I think the only one we haven't done so far is professional football, which is ironic because a couple of professional football players do have LP Shariata and they've spoken at, at our conferences. And I should mention this is American football, not football as it's known as through the rest of the world, but what we call here soccer. <laughs> so the reason we haven't done any football games is because the stadiums are enormous. It's just too big to do the on-field ceremonies and the scoreboard messages. But we've, in fact, there was even one year 
we bought some ad space at the Indianapolis 500, which is an annual uh, auto race here that's held Memorial Day weekend. And so any kind of sporting event you can use, any type of event where there's people and you have to know the organizers and you know they're going to have ad space, you can do that to spread awareness of Alpi Shariata. And what a lot of people do in the United States is they try to time those events in September, which is our awareness month, which is recognized by Congress. So throughout September, which happens to also be like when our baseball season is coming to a head, that's where we're you know having our championship games. That's where you see like a lot of team up events occur then. That's where you see the bulk of like our big fundraisers occur then. You know, what I said about spreading awareness is the same thing for fundraising. If there's something you like to do, you can turn that into a fundraiser. You know, if you're someone, say, who likes to paint and you want to teach other people how to paint, you can turn that into a fundraiser. You can say, okay, to take my painting class, it'll cost you $10. All proceeds are going to go in the half. You know, if you're someone who likes to run, you know, you can enter a local marathon, which a lot of people do, and you can use that to like raise money. We've had people enter like, I believe like the Boston Marathon, New York Marathon, you know, Marathon here in the Bay Area. And they've done that to raise money for now. If you like to cook, I know lots of people are like, you know, brushing up on their cooking skills, you know, because of COVID, you have to cook more for yourself and I can't go to restaurants. You can do that. You can like do a bake sale, you know, you can do anything you really like to do. If let's say you are working somewhere, I know right now most of us work from home, but let's say if you were working in an office and they have a dress code or your school has a dress code, go to, you know, your boss or go to, you know, your school's principal and say, hey, on this, say, last Friday of the month in September, can we make that Alpi Shariata Awareness Day? And we can either like, you know, wear jeans or we can wear a hat or we can just wear something. And those who want to participate, again, can spend, you know, $10, $20, whatever they want to, you know, contribute. And in return, they can like wear whatever they like. And we have awareness bracelets too, which we're happy to send folks to organize these. And they can hand out those awareness bracelets. They're blue, because that's the color for Alpi Shariata, these blue awareness bracelets. We'll send you that. And you know, that's a great way to spread awareness. It's whatever you like doing. If you like golf, we we have instructions on how to do a golf tournament. You know, we have like an incredible packet, which we can send to anyone who really wants to hold a big event. And I would encourage folks too. If you're attending our next conference, whether it's going to be in person or virtual, uh, make sure to sign up for our workshop on advocacy and awareness, because we have people who've actually put on these events, give presentations, and you'll learn from these folks, like what are their secrets and what they do. And these are people who've raised huge amounts of money. You know, they are very good at this and they're just regular folks. They're not professional fundraisers at all. They're just regular people in our community who are very creative. You know, we had one woman, in fact, who she's in Miami. She do, did one where it was like, it was supposed to be like a casino, you know, and she was able to get, so they set up a big casino. There was another year she did one where the theme was like the Great Gatsby and everything was 1920s theme. And I know she's got another theme fundraiser coming up. I won't give away what it is, but it's a really cool theme she's thought of. And hopefully, again, COVID allowing, she's able to do it next year sometime. So it's just whatever you can imagine, whatever you can think of, whatever you can enjoy, you can do it for the benefit of now. I absolutely love all of those ideas. I've just got to smile ear to ear for those. Obviously, it's an audio, so you can't see what we look like. But so much excitement, so much creativity, and it really is limited only to your imagination. And you've given us like dozens of ideas there. So um, thank you so much for sharing, Gary. I also just really love hearing the stories of those that have had a lot of fun doing these types of things, both, you know, something as enjoyment, but also raising money for something that they really believe in as well. So I just want to say thank you so much for spending the time with us and joining us, you know, after a hard day's work on the other side of the globe. It's so great to just be a bit more connected and, and learn the amazing things that you're doing at NAP. Well, I, it is such a privilege to speak with you today. And I really appreciate you having me. I really just, you know, I can't say enough about our community. I really, I mean, they're the stars. What I've seen them do time and time again just amazes me, just absolutely blows my mind. Not just me, but the whole NAF staff. We are always just so, again, just our breath is taken away literally by what they're able to do. Our newsletter just came out. We have a, we do a newsletter every winter and every, uh, every fall. And so the fall newsletter just uh, came out, we just mailed it out, and the cover 
was taken, this photo was taken by one of our community members when we did the virtual conference last June. We'd never done a virtual conference before. We had to cobble it together very quickly. So obviously everything was being done by a computer. And normally, you know, we have a professional photographer at the conference and we have thousands of incredible photos. And obviously we couldn't have that this year, but this one community member in New York City, she knows that her dog, not only her family, her dog was watching the conference online. And she took a photo of that and sent it to me. And I thought that was such an adorable photo. And that ended up being the cover of our newsletter. And we are getting such feedback on that right now. People love that cover. So again, this community of ours, they are so terrific. You know, I always look to them for, for strength and, you know, they give me what I need, even though NAP was set up to give them what they need. It, it works both ways. You know, I take a lot of strength from them every year. And so, you know, when they are sad that we can't have the conference in person, I know just what they're going through. We are just as crushed as they are. You know, one of the privileges I have of overseeing our legislative efforts is I usually go to DC every September and NAF budgets me enough so I can take like 30 legislative liaisons and their families with. Me. And we get together, we have a big dinner the night before we go to the Hill. You know, we then go to all these meetings with senators and Congress people. We get into our groups, we're grouped by states. We do a big, a big photo, group photo on the Capitol steps. We then have an amazing lunch at my favorite restaurant in all of Washington, D.C., which is the Senate cafeteria, believe it or not. It's awesome. And I miss doing that. You know, I can't wait for the day where we can all do that safely again, because that's what recharges my batteries. That's what gives me the power I need to help others. So it really works both ways. And, uh, you know, we really look forward to that. We can see everyone in person, but no one should think that NAF has been, you know, somehow that our efforts have been weakened by COVID. They have not, not at all, even though we're working from home, we're still working for you every day. We're here, write us at info at NAF.org. We will get back to you. Find us on Facebook, find us on Twitter, find us on Instagram. Any questions you have, we are more than happy to answer for you. If it's one of those rare questions that we cannot answer, we will find the answer for you and we'll learn something ourselves. That's fantastic. Well, thank you, Gary. Thanks for your time. It's just been so wonderful talking to you. What a fabulous conversation. I had so much fun speaking with Gary and you can just hear the excitement and the enjoyment in his voice when he's talking about NAF and he's been with the organization for almost eight years and it just sounds like they have a lot of fun there which is awesome. The three deeper than skin insights that stood out to me was just to learn more about alopecia areata. We haven't spoken about it on this podcast before. It can be quite a debilitating condition because it completely changes the way that someone looks and sometimes the way that they feel about themselves or where they are placed in the world as well. We talked about lots of misconceptions, including one that some people have been concerned that alopecia areata, especially when they've lost hair from their nose or from their eyes, that they may be more susceptible to COVID. And thankfully, this has no connection as yet. So there were some uh, common misconceptions that have been debunked today as well. Number two, impact. The NAF organization has over 60 thousand members. And yes, the US has a bigger population. However, uh, I just want to stress here just how incredible it is when people come together and build public awareness and how a collaborative effort can raise funds and increase research to find causes, treatment protocols, and cures for different conditions. And not to underestimate how important and what an impact a foundation can have when people come together. And number three, just all these amazing activities that NAF has done. Uh, And the activities are really only limited to the creativity of its members, from being involved in sporting games to different workshops, to camps, to pizza nights, uh, to musical events. It is uh, really amazing to hear about how the alopecia or the National Alopecia Areata Foundation is really driven by its members. And there's lots of ways to do fundraising. It's not just, you know, selling chocolates at a a school or 
or doing a fate and things like that. There are so many different creative ways that you can either get involved with NAF or if you're a part of another foundation or organization, start thinking outside the box at some of these creative ways and perhaps look at what NAF has done so well and think about how you could perhaps raise some more awareness in the uh, foundation that you're a part of. Thank you so much for joining for another episode of the Heal Thy Skin podcast. Uh, Until next week, be skin powered.